Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess a new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Pick it up next week. I would like everybody to know I wish discernment for them more than all else. Not ready yet to each in their own time. Long has it been in coming to this, wallowing through the uncertainty of false righteousness, trailing fragment truth. The spirit found me, courting awkward circumstance, recognition with others of kindred soul. Awakening, I went seeking others. We are to remind each other, one another, of past legend even as we question our own soul's knowing. And we laugh passing time, sharing passages of favored scripture immortalized to paper. He will come again, announcing presence with signs and wonder. Night recedes, sunrise on the lips of morning. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here at freedomslips.com on Studio B. And I thank those of you that have joined us live and are, uh, have access to the chat for taking the time to fellowship and for always lending us your very kind support. Uh, we consider you to be very well-educated and uh, a blessing to share dialogue with. I have as guests with me this evening for the next two hours, both Dan Duvall and Carolyn Hamlet. Um, and I um, consider it a great honor to be able to, to share this interview with them and share this time and space to talk about the incredible information that uh, both Carolyn and Dan have to offer uh, humanity and world. And so I thank both of you for taking the time to join me this evening and for giving me the opportunity to bring forth this show in the capacity that we are. Uh, Dan, let me give you a chance to say hello, and then we'll go to Carolyn. Well, thank you so much, Zen. It's a pleasure to be back on your program. I really appreciate the invite for both me and Carolyn. Uh, we had a great time last time, and we're able to share some really, really, uh, I think, uh, incredible things. And um, I just appreciate your ability as a host to bring out all of that. So I have a personal ministry website at bridemovement.com, and people can go and check that out. I have several books on there as well as links to our podcast and also a blog. And um, that's about it for me, Carolyn. Hey, um, thanks for having me back on Zen. It's uh, really enjoyed doing the last program. Um, you're a wonderful wonderful host to to work with feel very much at ease with you and uh anyway thank you thank you again and for the gracious welcome well and, uh, I, I appreciate both of you as well and and thank you um let me and i know dan that you have a radio program and carolyn you have a website so before we go any further dan if you'll talk about where people can go to support your work and um, any contact information, Facebook or anything of that nature that you might want to share. And uh, Carolyn, then, you know, we can talk about your your website and your blog as well. Well, uh, my podcast is called Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. I guess the easiest way to find that is just to Google Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall or just Dan Duvall. It comes right up on the Google rankings and um, – it posts on various things. I go on Blog Talk and 
Podomatic and Spreaker and everything posts over to YouTube. The central point to find all of that that we're putting out is bridemovement.com, which has links to our archives for the radio program as well as a uh, link to our YouTube channel um, and also different pages that describe everything we're endeavoring to do. One of the things we are putting together is uh, a, a, a vision for DID coaching. This is uh, an attempt to help people that have dissociative identity disorder as a result of satanic ritual abuse and government-sponsored mind control projects that cannot afford to finance their own help. And uh, we're starting off with a, a team of coaches that we're putting together to work with individuals, um, all of the costs being underwritten by the ministry itself. And then um, phase two and three include the building of uh, places uh, facilities in order to help people whose living situation is so compromised they can't be helped under current circumstances. And so uh, we are uh, <laughs> um, accepting donations, and if people want to support some of the work that we're doing, they can also just go to bridemovement.com. Well, that's a fantastic endeavor. Um, I applaud you in your efforts to you know service and to provide support in, in that manner. That is... Uh, I know a lot of people will be very greatly appreciative. Uh, Carolyn? Well, I have just a blog site, and it is beyondthephysicalrealm.com. I've had that probably, I think, since, I think, 2006. So um, I periodically add articles to that, some of my thoughts, I have plans to add much more and also to do my own like videos for YouTube channel. That'll be next, hopefully. Uh, can you mention like um, some of the latest blog uh, posts that you've done or that you've been working on? Well, the most recent one, it was actually to announce this show that we're doing right now. <laughs> So, uh, there's just there was just a, an increase of interest on this topic, and so I went ahead and made that made a separate post to let people know. You know, if they a lot of people go onto my blog daily, and so I wanted them to make sure that they they saw that because I think what we're going to be covering tonight is really important information, and I think a lot of people are going to be able to relate to it. So um, that's why I did that. I also reposted an article that I wrote a couple of years ago. It's called, I Am Not Afraid. I Was Born for This. And that is pretty much, that's my statement. And that's how I live my life. And many people I know are the same way. I mean, in this world, it's like there are no civilians. It's, there's like, there's a war that's actually going on, a spiritual war. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I think um, that a lot of people will be inspired and are inspired by your stance with truth and with Christ and with the make, making a priority of the kingdom. Because a lot of people find themselves on the fence and they can't decide one way or the other, especially for those that are just initially awakening to uh, for instance, the New World Order and the global elite and um, the push for police state government and uh, all of the things that are connected with that, the FEMA concentration camps, all that. And so a lot of people are afraid and they um, really, you know, once they are open, open themselves to the possibility of accepting this as truth, um, they are scared and they don't know really which way to turn because when they, because I know when I first woke up, I wanted to talk about these kind of things with, you know, all my loved ones, my friends, all my family members, anybody that um, would listen, this is the, the things that I wanted to talk about. But then I, I found really that nobody wanted to talk about these things. And not a lot of people, especially back in 2004, could relate to uh, the things that I was learning. And, um, and that held uh, priority for me as being important. Because um, another thing that happens when, when we find ourselves awakening is that 
it's hard for us to just you know go back to the the old sense of being to where we could be nonchalant about a lot of topics um i i became very serious in nature and in my study and i didn't want to waste any time and and it was out only after a while you know after several years of uh basically um running my family and my friends uh, away from me that i learned to not be all serious all the time and to find to to learn to find joy and entertainment and humor in life again and not to be always just focused on these very heavy issues because I, I found it to be burdensome to to soul to always be focused on just the the heaviness of you know the studies that we do with uh, conspiracies and new world order and that kind of thing and so um and so yours uh, dan's myself all those that are doing this kind of work to try to help people to understand what we're dealing with as far as uh, the matrix uh, of world and the situation, the the spiritual warfare against these powers and principalities and those that have um, taken allegiance with them. Um, it, it's encouraging and it helps people to find forums to where they can talk about these things and find others that they can, you know, relate to that um, also ha have done some, at least some of the research uh, to make themselves informed on on these topics. And, and it's still, you know, even today, uh, we're really still a minority um, that most people have still little regard and not much concern for uh, those things which are important to us as far as uh, learning truth. Um, comment, Carolyn, and then we'll get Dan to comment. Well, I totally relate to, <laughs> to what you said. And uh, I'm still trying to find the balance. It's uh, trying, well, much of my life I didn't have much humor. I've actually been learning how to to enjoy life more. I mean, there was a time where I enjoyed life, but it it was like about when I just before the 2000 election, I call it selection, presidential right. selection <laughs> in the United States, and you know, toward the end of Clinton's reign, well, even I can back up further. You know, some of that information's on my blog. When I started seeing what I knew was going to happen from being in the organization and knowing what their plan was. Since I was out of it, um, of course, I wasn't happy and looking forward <laughs> to what was ahead. So, I mean, I had a hard time having fun because I couldn't forget the reality that I lived that moment, what I knew was real and what was happening, that a lot of people didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. I knew. And especially when 9-11 uh, happened, Right. A lot of people woke up then too, but it was like to me. I just, I just knew that that was it. You know, I just, I had to try to get more of a, my information out. I was trying before that time, and it was difficult, and it even got even more difficult after 2001. But the thing is that uh, now, you know, in spite of how reality oriented I am. I still have to, to look for the, the things to laugh at, the smell the roses along the way. There's still right. a lot of good, a lot of good in this world. So um, I just try to try to enjoy that. And I encourage everybody else to also. I mean, the, we can, when we get, when people wake up, they generally are very zealous and enthusiastic. Right. And they have the energy. They can burn out, you know. So, exactly. And they can burn everybody else out around them if they're not careful. So um, I just encourage everybody, don't give up on people. Just, you know, pray for them to help help wake them up. And some of these people will not wake up until things get really bad. And then they might have to look up and see what's happening. All right. Yeah, here's another thing, and then, and then we'll go to Dan, um, that I wish I would have known or that somebody would have um, kind of schooled me on when I first 
came to realization about some of these things like 9-11 and the government-sponsored terror and the conspiratorial side of, as far as the what we're dealing with as world is that um, to honor people where they are and if they're not ready for the information to not just try to drill them, um, you know, to, to, to not just, you know, overwhelm them with stuff that they're going to just uh, think is absolutely crazy anyways, because um, I know that I you know, turned a lot of my friends and my family members, um, had them turn the other way and run as fast as they can just because they didn't want to listen to the things that I wanted to talk about, and they weren't ready. Um, and there was a time where some of them came full circle and, um, and you know, came to ask me about those things that I had mentioned before, but I find it's a lot easier to just now to plant seeds and allow people to be where they are, and when they reach a point where they're ready for the information that you want to share with them, that they'll be more eager as well to to open themselves and to grasp um, what you're speaking on. Dan? Well, um, I've run into the same things. Uh, you know, I've been kicked out of churches and been called a heretic, which, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, name it. Um, what, what I found is similar to what you're saying. People that need it the most sometimes are the, the, the most resistant to it uh, when you're talking about getting people caught up to speed with what is actually happening. I tell people to take it back to Ephesians chapter 4. It, there's, there's a reference to speaking the truth in love. Ephesians 4 verse 15. And I tell people that means speaking the right truth at the right time with the right motive. Right. And that keeps your hands clean and your motives pure when you are engaging people uh, and trying to wake them up. Um, I know like my paradigm has gone through many, many shifts then, and I have gone from, like, uh, conspiracy Nazi, like, oh, my gosh, I have to know everything, and this is all depressing, and I, you know, doing a tailspin, crash my plane, like, ah, I just want to die, and, you know, all that, and uh, progressed through that into a lot of revelation, really, about who God is and what his plan is, and we'll be talking about that somewhat tonight, the plan of God, um, but for me... It's been the relationship with God and getting his perspective on things that have revolutionized not only my life but my ministry as a whole. Um, I, I work with a number of people, as you can imagine, you know, government-sponsored mind control, uh, satanic ritual abuse, you name it. I hear the worst of the worst every day, then every single day. I'm talking um, – Murder, rape, torture, abuse, neglect, brutality. Um, <laughs> every day, that's what I hear. And you know what? In spite of that, many of my sessions where I'm working with people are filled with laughter. <laughs> and, yes. and it's because of this. The Bible says, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. And what I found is that in the presence of God, there is joy that transcends circumstance and situation, knowledge base and fact. And when we abide in that presence, then it changes everything. There's a reason why Psalm 2 says the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. He's not intimidated by his enemies at all. Right. And when we graduate into his perspective, <laughs> we begin to shame the devil with our attitude, mm -hmm. actions, and breakthroughs. And relationship with God that changes everything about us and the world around us. You know, so I, I, I have a perspective that it carries me through the work God has called me to do. And, um, you know, I, I, I just rejoice that, you know, he's taught me how to not sink my ship on these things. Well, I think, you know, with that kind of attitude, too, that you're going to be so much more of a, a better healer. And you'll help people to to accept and to find the joy in life again because coming I, I you know myself I could not even imagine um, going through the things that even Carolyn has had to endure 
with the different abuse and uh, things of that nature. Hold on, we've got a caller. I'm going to see if they have a... Uh, actually, um, I said that I'm not going to take calls on this show, and uh, so we're not going to do that, and so I, I apologize to those of you that do want to call in, but um, the uh, information is important, and I want to give both Dan and Carolyn as much time as I can to speak on the things that they want to uh, cover. And so um, we're, we're not going to accept calls during the, the course of this show, just so you know. Um, all right, but anyways, I, you know, I cannot even imagine the things that individuals that have gone through the different, um, the mental and the emotional, the physical and the, the sexual abuse and how they do that to program people in a certain way, uh, how most people would never be able to, to pull themselves from, you know, such a dark space, a, a dark place to be able to, um, to recover and to be able to, to find joy again in life and to be able to, uh, to even laugh, you know, and to be able to, uh, even come to any sense of uh, of normalcy, um, I, it has to be just completely overwhelming. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, Carolyn? Because I, I know that your faith and um, your knowledge and relationship with uh, Yeshua, with Christ, with um, the Most High Yahweh Elohim, and and the, the Holy Spirit that these things have enabled you to get to where you are. Um, we're, we'll have a break in about six minutes, and then after that we'll go into the uh, some of the other topics that you had wanted to, to speak on. Well, I hope that through this program that a lot of people will will kind of get that information from Daniel and myself and also from you from you Zen because I that we serve a mighty creator righteous creator he I simply simply put at this point I can say that I know for a fact he is our creator he's the one who who has the blueprint not only for the universe but for us we are Truly, we are truly created in his likeness and his image. That is something that many people have not heard. They may have, they may think they've heard the message. They may think they have heard the truth of who they are spiritually. But most people have not. God has our blueprint. He's the only one who can put us back together. He's the only one who can heal us. The, the dark side, Satan is real. Lucifer's real. You can, he can lie and tell people through demonic spirits, through entities from his hierarchy. He can tell people that he can make them better. He can enhance them through G DNA, through spiritual, like so-called spiritual enlightenment. As uh, we will be talking in this program, as my testimony goes and shares, shows that the, that is a lie. They, the only one that can truly heal us is the one who created us, who has that blueprint. And I would never, ever go back to anything that I did before when I served in the dark hierarchy. There is only God's kingdom and there is a kingdom that has, that as the enemy has made God their enemy. There's only two. Yeah, um, one of the things, like, I know that you know that I, I have a disability. And for myself, when I had broke my neck and became a, a quadriplegic, it was completely, it dissolved my whole world. And I... Um, it's my only, the way that I can kind of relate to your story and others, um, Carolyn, and having to pull yourself, 
you know, out of out of the darkness and to kind of pick up the pieces of what is remaining. Um, and, and so in that kind of sense, it was the same for me in that I had to rediscover my faith and relearn, um, you know, well, afterwards I went to a lot of restudying and looking at these scriptures in renewed light and having um, found myself and re rediscovered my faith, I was able to look at what Christ went through in allowing himself to be brutalized and murdered and conspired against in his life um, and, and dying on the cross for us to bring us a chance to have forgiveness of sins and to, a chance to um, establish our, ourselves anew with realigning ourselves in allegiance to um, what his mission and his role in coming into the flesh and um, and allowing himself to be murdered in such a way. I, I just compared, you know, the struggle that I was going through with what I was having to, you know, pick up the pieces of all that was broken and just imagine what he went through in his life. And it gave me strength. And, and, and I know that this is the same for all of us that have um, understood his mission and his role, his goal for coming here and for allowing himself to be the Passover lamb to give us a forgiveness of sin, to have a clean slate so that we could take part in salvation and have an eternal inheritance, which was just uh, glorious and forever to have a restoration of our immortal, bright natured status, that which we were um, part of before coming into the flesh. It, it can restore all hope in a person. We'll, we'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen, and I have as guests with me this evening both Dan Duvall and Carolyn Hamlet. Uh, Carolyn, we have a question from the chat room, and I think this will be the uh, perfect question to lead into a segment that you wanted to speak on anyways. Um, Jer Bear asks, uh, I'd like to know when the secret space program was created. Uh, so if you have any, um, you know, any notion on that, if you'll share. And then let's go into some of the recall that you have about um, the moon and uh, particular buildings. Um, some of the phenomena that you were witness to that you saw there. And also how it was that you became... Um, aware of this information? Well, I'm not sure exactly when the secret space program began. I'm thinking back that at least at the time of President Eisenhower. The um, uh, reason I think that is because of some of my information that has come back to me 
that's, you know, classified papers that I've, I just have information that's just broken through, like, um, I guess it'd be like, like a veil in the memory that's come through, or I've seen classified information and, and seals on the information. Also, I have a relative, close relative, who was in the military that kept things secret, but I know enough to think that this particular relative was involved in some high-level stuff with the military and and a couple of the presidents. So um, I know for myself, I have had memories most of my life, like as a young girl, is it oh, just, I don't know, probably six or seven years old. They, they first began about that time. I think I may have mentioned in a, the last program, I'm not sure if I did or not, but I had an interest in the space program or just space in general back when I was uh, probably five or six years old, or, if not younger. And, of course, that was the late 50s. Well, I have memories of being trained with other people, other kids, um, also, I've had information come forward to me that applies to Apollo, the, the Apollo program and training of children. Uh, but I do have memories. I've, I've seen other people. I've seen other accounts that other people have also shared that are similar to mine. And the reason I'll mention mine is because I believe there are many people out there that probably have these memory recalls and they're not sure what it means and they try to dismiss them but they can't because it isn't like it, like sometimes they'll come across as dreams but you you know dream, reoccurring dreams are one thing but when you dream that you're with the same people learning to operate a certain type of a craft that doesn't even exist i mean talk about a wild imagination you know, you know how to operate a craft, you know what it looks like, you know the people that you are with, and you continuously meet with that team. But the operations you do and what you where you go is not always the same. Well, even as a child, I had memories of being with a with well, actually it's working with two to three people. And I had those memories and experiences throughout my life. So I didn't know what to do with them. I really didn't. I know what they are now. You know, it just it's just taken some of the years to try to piece my, the, uh, put the pieces together. People, see, there's a thing about denial. People are programmed to deny, to fall into denial, to think, you know, oh, that's nothing. It's, you know, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a dream. But you know what? Those things keep popping up. And now, if anybody in the audience is listening to what I'm saying and it's ringing true to them, that they keep wondering, why does that keep coming back in my mind? It's because your subconscious mind is trying to get you to look at it. So take a look at it. Maybe it does mean nothing, but maybe it does mean something. When there's a lot of things that keep coming up like that, um, it's kind of like it charts out a, I look at it as a, like a treasure map in a way. They're all connected somehow or another. So you will, you will find out where they're connected. And, it, and it's interesting to find out how everything paints the picture. So the space program's been, secret space program's been going on for many, many years. So um, I think that my parents were probably somewhat involved in that on just, well, they, it, I, I don't think, I'll, I better not really go into that because I don't think that my, my father was, he was used in a lot of different ways with the like with the mind control and as like a, a guinea pig in the military where they, they tested him out with things they tried to, I don't know what all they did to him. He told me a lot of, he told me some of it. And I still haven't told that story yet, which I mean, there's so much I could tell. But I don't believe they used him in the space program. But what they do in the organization is they keep track of if they think that they have a good combination, a man and woman, and they have children, they keep track of the children and see what type of, where, where those children will excel in. And some children aren't used, and some are, and some are specialized according to what their aptitude is and their level of interest. So uh, 
I was used in a lot of different areas be, because of that and because of the, gosh, it goes so deep. It's even the bloodline, you know, right. I don't know where to stop, you know, cause I keep, when I talk, I start seeing all kinds of things I could talk about. So, um, shall I just well, go into about <laughs> the, the moon thing or? Yeah. If you would, um, talk about you, you, your own experiences with, if you know if it's the secret space program or uh, how it was that you were led to the this information that you're about to get into on the moon, um, was it remote viewing your dreams? Um, it, please elaborate and and yeah. feel free to follow any tangent. Um, you know, uh, well, go where go ahead, Dan. You got a quote? Yeah, l- let me uh, say a few things. That will help people understand kind of where Carol is coming from. Sure, sure. So that uh, you know she can freely begin to just elaborate on the story itself. Um, one, when a person is recovering memories, what they run into is the fact that many of these memories are stored in the subconscious. That that is a, a, an area of the mind. There is the conscious mind. There's the subconscious mind, and then there's what is also known as the superconscious mind. It's the three levels. Um, and the subconscious mind is also where a lot of our dreams are expressed from. So when a person has a lot of memories that have been compartmentalized and uh, uh, had, had amnesic barriers put up so they couldn't recall them with their conscious mind, those will emerge from the subconscious mind sometimes in dreams. But – and this is a real uh, kicker here, and this is going to – give a lot of clarity on the whole subject of the secret space program. Um, yeah, Carolyn is going to be sharing her story today. From my perspective, though, Carolyn is one of six people I'm working with that are all recalling memories of the secret space program. So when I say that there is a trend I have noticed, it's because I'm speaking on behalf of a number of other individuals. And one of the things that they really, really like to do with the secret space program is in, implicate people's alters in that secret space program. In other words, they don't want the individual that's at the front or that's the one that you would meet on a day-to-day basis to know anything about the secret space program. And they'll take it a step further, and many of the ways they will use people's alters, which are fragments of the individual's core or the original essence of what they are as a human, okay, they will use those parts themselves out of body in order to engage their secret space program agendas. And so what many people don't realize is that the memories they pull back, if they are pulling back memories at all, are occur during time frames they know they could not have been implicated in a secret space program it's like well no that was the day that was that was the year that i was hanging out you know with my friend and and so on and so forth there's no way that could have been real and and it will because it was it was them it was a part of them pulled literally out of body like an astral projection and operating in that program they have actually learned how to implicate people's parts and this is how we understand what happened to Carolyn in as far as her memories of getting to the moon because it wasn't her per se that was going there at at, at least in the memory that she had recovered and talked about on my program was it was a part of her named Wayne (laughs) and so picking up with the concept that they will use a person's alters in order to implicate them in the secret space program I'll let Carolyn pick up with her story of of Wayne actually it's uh it's Alex. Oh, gosh. It must be somebody. Uh, yeah. Just a, I don't know. I don't want to get mixed up on. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's Alex. This one's Alex. Yes. Um, first, I'd like to mention that. I, I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and go ahead and say this. I mean, there's just different ways that alters are used. And because of my bloodline, I actually, I have a close male altar very close to the my core it's actually a male altar this altar can he actually can take a a, a form of a man he's a shapeshifter okay that's pretty far out i'm not going to be talking to probably won't be mentioning about him but that's one way that one thing that they do in the bloodlines is if they have somebody that through the bloodlines 
is still is capable, has that ability to shape shift, and it does come from also the demonic side. The help from that is really kind of complicated in a way. Um, how that can be pulled in? I mean, it's it's complicated, but it isn't. And, and I just don't I don't have time to go into really all the dynamics right. on why I am I have been able to do that. But okay, so the male altar can be used, has been used in the past to materialize in a male form and to do work. Okay. Now there's another altar that I have that is able was actually a body was created for him. That's Alex. And yet there is a, another one that I will be, if we have time in this program, I'm going to be talking about a trans, uh, um, it's a, uh, it's um, what is it? A trans, where's my mind? <laughs> it's a transporter. Actually, it's an off world transporter. That particular altar takes a body. It is inserted in a, like a clone body. So, I mean, all this is going to blow a lot of people away. You're, if this is the first time you've heard about this, this is not going to be the last time. So, anyway, Alex. Okay. On the picture that I made, I made a rendition and that I have on my blog of the building that I saw on the moon. I purposely didn't tell a soul about the shape of the building. I just mentioned a couple to a couple of people I had seen a building on the lunar surface. The reason I didn't mention the shape is because, first of all, I wanted to see if anybody else ever came up with that, had ever seen the same thing. I couldn't find anybody that had ever seen the same thing. So I just decided to go ahead. When uh, Daniel invited me on the program with Gans Shimura, I decided to go ahead and for the first time talk about it. Daniel didn't even know what the shape of the building was or anything about it. And I didn't tell much on that particular program about this. But when I, when I did the rendition of this and put this on my blog, um, if anybody reads what I have there, I said the above picture is my rendition of what I have seen with physical eyes while aboard a lunar bound craft. All right. I didn't say with my physical eyes because I didn't think that that was, that was totally honest to say my physical eyes because it was me. It was an altar. And I do have that memory very crystal clear, not only of approaching the building, but with the people that were on the craft with me and also some things that took place inside of the building. I put with physical eyes was, I had to think about this. Like, well, how should I word this? And I thought, well, it, it's true. It was with physical eyes. So I, that's how I, that's why I worded it that way. So Alex, what Alex is, he is a male altar. He, uh, the people on the craft didn't know that he wasn't human. He was sent on an assignment with this this group. There was a special, a special like an or, a, like a. There's several things going on in the building on the moon at that time, and there was a huge meeting going on. People from all over the world were there, and um, one of them I think I recognized. Uh, I still don't want to say who that is, but that was one of the council people. Okay, let me back up. I'll tell you what Alex, how Alex was created, just a little bit about it. Um, I don't know the how the technology works. I will just tell you that what he did, he, what he did in order to, when, whenever he was used, okay, he was, he was programmed with certain abilities and knowledge of, um, well, one thing he could do is operate crafts. He was... He had knowledge of some other languages. He was sent kind of, this was more like a, an espionage trip. He was there to collect information. All right. So he, when Alex was used or was ever called to be used, Alex is a, is a fragment of me. He's a altar of me. He would report like astral travel to the place where he would stand, his astral body would stand upon a small platform and there would be like an arc, like, like an A shape, 
something on the platform that would go above his head. It was open at the top. There'd be some sort of an electric charge that would happen. It would create a holographic image of, of him, of how he was to look. And it would, I don't know how it happened, but a physical body would be created. So it's, I know it sounds crazy like a sci-fi movie. I'm just telling you that that's what they do. And you'll hear probably other people report the same things also, that the military has, I don't even want to call it the military. It's just like secret government military has the capability to do things you just, it's beyond your wildest imagination. Okay, so Alex was actually on a craft bound to the lunar surface to that building for a gathering of, actually it wasn't just humans. There were greys. There were greys in that building. I've dealt with greys throughout my life as me. You know, through, I have memories from early childhood, even on to even a few years ago. I've seen lots of different types of greys. I've worked with lots of different types of greys. Um, I could actually do an entire program on the greys. <laughs> so, anyway, the greys know Alex. They know that Alex is me. The greys took me aside, and they actually took me down one of the, the hallways in the building. I think it's an outer hallway. I didn't get to see the entire building, but the reason they took me was that they wanted to take me aside. They wanted to let me know that they were though I was in, somewhat impressed with the building and the people that were there it's like it was my first time there and I and actually it was my last time there I've been there one time the grace told me that they were the ones that had pretty well put together the building that the humans want to take credit for it that the grays have other other bases there that if it was not for their technology there would be nothing on the moon whatsoever but that the people the united states mainly but it isn't just the united states it's global governments meet there in that building that's a trapezoid building so and, and other people that they that are tied to them it's like it have to be pretty well up there in the global governments in order to even find out about the building and go there so anyway, the Greys pretty much they they pretty much let me know that they were in charge of what goes on in that building, and they were allowing the humans to think that the kind of take credit for it. So that was just my experience with the Greys. Inside the main inside the building, there was a large room. It was a uh, kind of like a banquet hall. There were many people there from all over the country. A lot of them were dressed in their cultural uh, historical outfits. There was. There was food being served, drinks, um, a lot of talk going on, you know, just some political talk, some just superficial talk. Then after that, at one point, that was where the the uh, council was at the top that sat up the top at the high podium. And within the audience, it was um, a group meeting that these were not the ones that were in the milling around in the banquet banquet room these were a group of people that serve the council and there were many of us there they we all said an oath except actually i didn't say it i was the only one in the entire group that didn't say the oath um I think I even have written it down. I don't have my notes with me now uh, of what the oath was, or at least part of it. The main, main lady that was in charge just, I mean, she could stare a hole in me. It, was, it did not go unnoticed that I didn't say the oath. I couldn't say the oath. Maybe back when I used to serve in the organization wholeheartedly, I could, but I could no longer say the oath. And that... That is all I remember at this point of that that particular trip. Well, let uh, me let me ask yes. you a couple questions because we're going to be coming to break. But um, do you remember any other like any reptilian entities or tall whites? And we have when we come back from break, I'm going to ask you some questions that came up from the chat room. Um, but also, 
do you remember any of the content of the discussion, why people were going there, um, what was being discussed? And uh, also, last question, do you still... Well, we'll pick this up on the other side. We'll be right back, everyone. Welcome back, everybody, for second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen, and I have as guests with me both Dan Duvall and Carolyn Hamlet. Uh, before we continue on with the interview, I do want to remind everybody that Revolution Radio here at freedomslips.com, that we are the largest listener-supported, commercial-free and corporate-free platform for truth anywhere in the world or on the internet uh, there's many hosts I think uh, 70 plus coming to you 24 7 on two different studios and that we cover a wide range of esoteric topics the most important topics being discussed in current events and we do really need your financial support um, and if you value the content and the things that we're bringing to you, especially in shows like I'm doing now, um, please lend your support monetarily. For the price of one meal, uh, you can join the archives, four ninety five a month, and gain access to all of the MP3s from all the various hosts on both Studio A and Studio B. You can download them to your MP3, um, cr create data disks to listen to so you don't have to listen to commercials on the mainstream uh, radio networks. Um, and we're like 30% behind, and so I have been asked for you to please uh, do donate. Go to freedomslist.com, click on the donate button. It's very easy. We accept PayPal, uh, which is the safest way to donate or to purchase anything on the internet. And there's seed packs, there's various data disks, bullet drives, t-shirts, coffee mugs, all that kind of stuff is available as well. And know that we appreciate you in advance, but in order for us to continue doing what we do, um, we do need your support. And uh, God bless all of you in advance for helping us out. All right, um, Carolyn, there's uh, several questions from the chat room, and I want to get through these really quick. So I'm going to ask you these, and then we'll pick up with um, some other questions that I wanted to ask you. Really quick answers to this, if, if you would. Uh, first question is, uh, LG asks, um, Carolyn, your memories, hold on, let me read it. Are these memories that Carolyn has always had? Or has she had to recover them? And also, as far as the the memories about the the lunar building, as how old were you when um, when you experienced or you know had these visions? The one about the lunar building was not recovered. What you know, like you go like uh, it was a memory that Alex. It's it's kind of like it's hard to describe. Okay, I know you want like quick answers. Mm -hmm. What I can tell people is one way they can understand better how memories work, you know, how they've been programmed to be sectioned off from the conscious mind is to I want to refer people to the series of programs that Daniel 
Dr. Bailey, Dr. Preston Bailey, and Lauren Grace and I have been doing. It's called Are My Memories Real? We've done four programs so far. That will help people get a, a better understanding of, of how this happens. Because we don't have time to go in this program of how it does happen. Right. But the, I'll say the that. Website real quick again for the, oh, uh, those shows. Okay, it's called Are My Memories Real? To, to These, find. You, you can find them on Daniel Daniel uh, Duvall's site, which is, what is it, bridemovement.com. You yeah. can also find them on my blog, beyondthephysicalrealm.com. And also on Lauren Grace's blog or site, which is laurengrace.com. Is that correct, Daniel? laurengrace.com? Yes, that's that's correct. And it's spelled L-O-R-E-N, Grace, yes. not um, the alternative spelling that most people might assume. Yes. Okay, so, great. All right. This uh, was this was my memory, like a a regular memory. It's it's the only thing I can tell people is that if they have a memory that's been repressed, let's say someone was on a battlefield and they have a repressed memory, they don't remember what happened, but their buddy does. When their own memory returns, they will have the sensation of, oh my gosh, that's right. I always. I, I now I know I always remembered that I don't know why I could have forgotten it. How did that happen? It's it's a similar situation where you know it's your memory. Sort of like deja vu, huh? Well, it's it's it's, it's like crystal clear memory. I don't. It's not, not like deja vu, really. I mean, like some people think of deja vu. It's just you know it's your memory, and right. and it's always been there. It's a feeling that you know it's always been there. And how could you not? It's like part of you knows it's always been there, but another part of you didn't know it it's it's just hard to explain so anyway that is not a recovered memory like someone um like sometimes in that people will try to they'll sit down and try to write and journal and and sometimes memories will come forward that way uh well i don't know it's just hard to describe but anyway and it, it's, if i can um if yes, I can please, jump Daniel. real quick yes. uh to talk about this uh, one, I, I had a major case of foot and mouth disease in the last section, so I apologize about uh, speaking the wrong name. Um, definitely is Alex, and uh, so I, I am sorry about that. The other thing I wanted to say is that for people that have alters, it, understanding that an alter is a complete split off of that person's original essence, and it, it – he, he will have his own experiences, memories, and opinions of those memories, even viewpoint, on the inside of Carolyn. That alter, that part lives in the subconscious itself. So when an alter or a part is discovered by the front during a session, or you know, when when they're working with a person, or or just even by themselves, this can be done with journaling and other tools. Um, Often the way it works is that that part of their subconscious will tell the person their story. They will actually inform the person what happened to them because they were the part of that person that experienced the event. As they are speaking, they will impart to the person the feelings body memories even at times, the depression, the, their own emotional state regarding what happened. And it's almost as if they are having a conversation with someone outside of the body, except that this is a part of them that is within the subconscious communicating to the front what happened. And so this would be more cl closely related to the nature in which uh, certain memories are being pulled back when it comes to this conversation. Thank you for that explanation, Daniel. Pre appreciate that. Um, all right, just a couple more questions, and then we'll get back to the topic um, before we went to break. Um, have you witnessed any Saturn worship among the elites, and um, what makes the bloodline important as far as the agenda well even those questions i mean it's like i have a hard time trying to decide okay i'm a i'm a very detail-oriented person so i feel like even if i try to answer something quickly it's not going to really cover it yeah so okay problem. saturn yes there's 
Uh, yes, they, Saturn is very important to the elite. And it isn't just, you know, we're, we're talking about the elite. People need to realize that we're, they may be talking about humans, but, okay, like the earlier question that we had before break, it was like, what was discussed and why was I there? Like, right. it's it's like anything that has to do with these people. They're not really, um, okay, some of them, okay, what it is is <laughs> these people, these beings, whether they look human or not, and the humans on Earth that that are in this program, they serve another being. Okay, that being they serve is real, as real as some of them. You know, I hear lots of people talk about, you know, some talk about reptilians. You know, we've talked about greys. I've heard, you know, I, I've seen numerous different types of beings and entities. Well, they all serve one other being. They all are within that being's hierarchy. Now, people talk about the people on Earth being Luciferians, the ones that are global, run the global, uh, they're trying to bring in the New World Order. Same thing. They serve that being who is Lucifer, who is Satan. The ones at the top of the, this organization, it, they're humans. They all know that it is Lucifer. He's very real to them. They serve in his hierarchy. They serve his plan. Okay, that's what was going on on the moon. They all are serving Lucifer, who is a being, and he has his hierarchy. He has his plan. Now, what I was hoping that we can get to sometime is to be able to distinguish that there is another hierarchy and that is the one I'm, I serve now. And it, that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was in the Bible. So if somebody else, okay, we're talking about testimonies. The last couple of, the last couple of weeks, there have been people trying to tell other people what my testimony is. Well, the best way to find out what my testimony is, to, is to hear it from me. Right. You know, people can misquote people and, uh, it's easy to misquote people. Some people don't do it intentionally, but it happens. So the best way to get the information is to go to the person. Well, I'm, I want to take that to the one step further and have people to encourage people to look at the Bible, yes. read at least the book of John. Now read it, read it in context. Now, Jesus Christ is who he said he was. And if somebody takes that literally, they need to take it literally. Read it in context. You can't take it any other way. Uh, gosh, there's so much I could even say about that. Daniel can even break it down into, and I'm sure Zen can too, into the uh, the ancient words that were used in the translation. But you can look at even the King James Version and get the full idea of what it is. Now, anybody that tries to tell you that it is not saying exactly what it says, they are not working for God to create a universe because Jesus Christ is not the avatar that people think he is. Now, some of the people listening to this program know what I'm talking about, so I don't have to go into detail about what an avatar is. Jesus Christ is God himself. Amen. So if you don't believe that, um, I think that if you actually take a look at what the Bible says, you'll see that that's true. I'm telling you it is true. I served in the satanic hierarchy, Lucifer's hierarchy. I understand very well how that works. I understand that the beings that a lot of people think are going to come save planet Earth and save them and raise their consciousness, um, those beings are not going to do that. They are part of Lucifer's hierarchy. There is not one single one of them that that works for God. Because look, you have to see who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is the, the provision that God has made for us. That's the rescue plan. God has a plan, and if you, I think most people haven't, have not heard it. So I'm, I'm not going to keep talking about that. I just, you know, I'm passionate about it because I know what the truth is now. I just want people, I want, I want everybody to know the truth. It's just been so watered down. You know, I'll, I'll make one more point, and then I'll try to get back to what we were talking about. But years ago, 1970, I think it was 1971, I had a kundalini yoga teacher that 
I mean, I just, we all thought this guy, you know, as much as I knew, you know, from even my background with having mentors that worked, that wrote books for Lucius Trust, you know, outlining the plan and, you know, the spiritual, high, Satan's spiritual hierarchy. I mean, I, I knew a lot of stuff and I worked out of body doing a lot of things for the organization. Well, this particular man, young man at that time, Mike Shreve, was a very, very, what I called highly evolved or thought highly evolved human being, ancient soul, that sort of thing. One day he didn't come to class. He's always came to class. This time he missed it. One of his friends showed up just before we were ready to leave and the class time would be, was, was just about over. One of his friends came and said that Mike had become, he had given his life to Jesus Christ. You know, none of us, oh, I mean, we just could not believe. How could a guy do that? How could he throw his, throw everything away, what he had for just, for Jesus? I mean, we went, we were just dumbfounded over the whole thing. Well, it took me years later. I know now, every single person I knew in that class are Christians now. I'm not talking about the Christians that are watered down things that are walking around that actually don't even resemble who Jesus Christ was. They don't even resemble the power that God has for us. The, I'm not talking about, okay, the, the occult side. A lot of people can know how the supernatural works in the occult side. They have a cheap imitation. And you aren't going to get the truth unless you get it straight through Jesus Christ, through, through, his, through God's plan with Jesus Christ. And, you know, I know my words probably don't sound like much to people. If it doesn't, just, just know that... I mean, if you could just, you could just see that I'm passionate about this, and there's a reason. Just pay attention to the passion and wonder why I have passion. Wonder why I gave all of it, all of that up. Wonder why Mike Shreve, he, he has Mike Shreve Ministry. You can look up his site. Why did he give it up? It's because we know what the truth is now, and we want you to know. We want you to know. It's so very important. So I'll, I'll shut up about that now. <laughs> Well, it's the most important thing because Jesus Christ, Yeshua, is the only way towards to salvation and to eternal inheritance. And that is the thing that matters. That's what we're really here for. Everything else is just an illusion. Uh, and for those that think that, uh, that Jesus is an, an ascended master or, or that he's just one of these um, you know, Anunnaki, or because there's so many people that believe that, or think that he's an ancient alien. Go to the Gospel of Bartholomew, because uh, there's a conversation in there where Satan Nell is speaking to Bartholomew, and he asks him uh, he about his creation, and he tells him that he was the first created archangel, but that it was the Son, it was Yeshua, it was Jesus Christ that created him and all of the other angels, which includes us, humanity, all of creation, everything that we were made uh, by the Father and the Son, So, uh, which is what it says in John. Um, let me give Daniel a chance to make a comment here, and then I'm going to ask you these last two questions, uh, Carolyn, and then we'll get back into some of this. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, <clears throat> it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And in the original Hebrew, if you read it, it says, In the beginning Elohim created et. And that word et has no English translation at all. And the, the Hebrew letters in that word that is not translated into the English language is Aleph Tav, which translates, if you were to do this in Greek, as Alpha Omega. In other words, beginning and end. In the beginning, God created Aleph Tav. Et is saying that in the beginning, God created everything through Jesus Christ. The Word of God. Amen. And so when you get to the book of John, and we see that everything that was made was made through him, Jesus Christ, we are pulling 
on the full understanding and revelation of what God intended to communicate in Genesis 1-1, that Jesus is the creator. He yeah. is the king of kings. He yeah. is the one that is the author of all life, inclusive of his number one adversary, Lucifer, who he already dethroned through his death, burial, and resurrection. Right. This is why I serve Jesus Christ. And when we get into the conversation of getting people free and liberated from the pain and the trauma and the strange events, the sleep paralysis, the depression, the, the uh, d desires and inclinations towards suicide and all of the related things that come along with being a targeted individual, someone that has been harassed and terrorized by demons, aliens, other kinds of life forms. It is the name and authority of Jesus Christ that trumps everything they have yeah. every time, and I see it then every day. Uh, yeah, you said it perfect, brother, and you're right. It is only the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, that can set people free and that these aliens and demons run from. So that in itself is verification of his authority because he is the only creator and that's the truth that we're hoping people will come to discernment upon um, alright going back to the what we were talking about as far as the building and stuff um, Carolyn real quick before we get to the next break they wanted to ask you about the council and she, they wanted me to ask you how tall these beings were and what their appearance was and also if you could talk about the oath that you would not um that you could not utter what what the oath was as best as you can remember okay the people on at the podium the council they looked human they um according to alex some of them are they may have human bodies but they're they're like hosts that he says some of them are reptilian that's the answer that goes with the reptilians that reptilians that the people that were there at that particular time were okay reptilians are very proud of what they are but there are times when they they need to not show what they are they don't like to not show what they are and it takes energy for them to to maintain a human form but that there were no at least alex did not see i as alex did not see any reptilian people there but it is known that there were some there yes and the oath um, what I will do is I don't remember right now the words of the oath. I have some notes that I was not able to get to today. I wanted to look up my old notes. Um, I've had major internet problems today <laughs> and my computer problems. And uh, anyway, when I get to my notes, I will – see, I wrote them a long time ago. I will see what I wrote about the oath. I only remember part of the oath, but I will try to share that on my blog when I find that. But it was like a pledging, it was like a t type of a pledging of allegiance. I remember that much. And all of us had to say it in unison. And I would guess it would be towards uh, Lucifer and the New World Order agenda, sort of like the Freemasonic, yes. you know, their blood oaths and their. Uh, um, you know, the whole secret ceremonies and their, the way that they do things in that way, I, I would guess it would be similar. Yeah, it was a, like a oneness and a pledging to, it was a pledging to the organization mm -hmm. and their plan, a oneness. And it's it's like, I, I know that if... Hold on, we'll be right back. Hold yes. on.
Okay, everybody, welcome back for our final segment. Um, one other question from the chat room, and then we had um, somebody ask about Atlantis, and so I thought that would be a, a good thing to go into as well. Um, but the question was, have you seen or experienced any other weird creatures, aliens, um, any kind of uh, beings, and are there any good aliens? Um, and if you know, uh, tall whites or anything of that nature, there are no good aliens, what people call aliens, they serve Lucifer, right? And I know it sounds like a pretty broad statement, but uh, I could say that statement because of where the position I had in the in Lucifer's hierarchy. Um, so I know his plan and all the things that people are seeing as angels. I mean, not angels, you know, some of those definitely are the, there's uh, the fallen ones. They, they appear as angels of God and they're not, you, um, I can't go into detail about how to test them. That'll have to, you know, maybe the people listening already know how to do that. Or that could be found on Daniel's site or my site and Zen's information. But, uh, I've seen numerous types of beings. A lot of them can change what they look like. And uh, a good way to find out how God, how God works his plan and how he operates is take a look at the Bible. You know, if you, you know, lots of, um, lots of these things that claim to be highly evolved beings that they're going to raise your vibrational level, all that kind of stuff. They can't do that. All right. What they're trying to do is they're trying to take you away from the absolute truth that there is a plan that they are keeping you from knowing they don't want you to know god's plan now how are you going to find out better about the bible and god's what god's plan is than to read it yourself right and if you don't want to read all the old testament stuff start like i said simply start at even the book of john um, read jesus's own words read it in context there's a lot of people out there and a lot of so-called things that are calling themselves highly evolved beings they can they can look like blues they can look like grays they can look like reptilians they can look like i mean i i've seen numerous creatures my mother saw numerous creatures but what they all do is they'll quote the bible they'll use the word of christ and make it say it's something it isn't they'll quote it but the reason they do that is because the bible is important and they don't want you to know it so back to talking about a testimony don't let them tell you what the Bible says. Look at it for yourself. Yes. Okay? You owe that to yourself. Don't let them use mind control on you. Like a friend of mine was reminding me the other day, what mind, the, you know, the, best, the worst part of mind control and the most used part of mind control that people don't even realize, it's when you allow yourself to be controlled by somebody else to turn you away from the truth. So mind control is to pre prevent you from even looking at the Bible, okay? So I'm telling you <laughs> to, to look at it, all right? So, um, yeah, I've seen lots of different types of beings. Uh, and, you know, when I'm on the subject, I want to mention right now that a lot of people in the program listening now may be familiar with something called the WESAC Festival. I will be putting something on my blog. It's a story that of my mother, some of her experiences at WESAC. It's, the, it's a high festival in, in this organization. So it's um, the Buddhists celebrate it, but in a little different way. So I want you to, to look for my look at my blog to see what I'm going to be talking about there. And when you look at it, when you look at this story I'm going to write, it's, it's my mother's story. Okay. Now she was there at the Ascended Masters. Some people can get to the Wiesak Festival, which is the full moon in May. They can get there physically on foot or whatever. It's in the Himalayas. Okay. Full moon in May. Um, not everybody gets there on the level of this, the Ascended Masters. Now, what they're telling you about these, these uh, festivals and these meetings, and it's going to raise your vibrational level? No, it's not. Okay, they're lying to you. And what they're trying to make you think that the Christ that shows up, it's not Jesus Christ. It's not the one in the Bible. It's a fake. It's a counterfeit. All right? So, now, when you read about the story I'm going to tell, it's, uh, I want you to consider well, how could somebody so high up in that organization and and no, I mean I mean gosh, I mean believe all that that a lot of the people are believing, raising their consciousness and all that. How could somebody be doing that and believe so much of it into that 
and then all of a sudden completely change? How could they turn? Now, I know my mother turned. That's another story. I know that she she was shown the truth. I, I, I 100%, 100% believe she was shown the truth that I was shown the truth. You get to a certain point up there, they want you to know exactly who, who Lucifer is, that he's not that beautiful being that they want to tell you he is. Um, I know – we don't have time for me to go into this program as to why I know, all right? So um, that will be on my blog too, maybe another – program we can do it but when you read my information that i have please ask yourself how could somebody know this be so up there in the organization and be working to help other people so-called raise their consciousness and then turn around and not want to do that that it's because we found out what the truth is and you know what the truth is so important that we risk our lives because we want you to know that truth you deserve it you deserve it you know what if if i got killed today if I get killed tomorrow, um, it could happen. I don't think it's my time yet, but the thing is, I want you to know the truth, and it's worth me risking my life, all right? So, sorry if I keep getting off on <laughs> getting off. It's just, uh, I just want people to know how important it is. I'm sorry. No, don't, don't be at all, Carolyn, because um, you are risking your life, and this is the most important message this is the most important thing for people to know because as we mentioned earlier it's the only thing that can lead to salvation is through Christ he is the way and the truth and the light and as God he came into the flesh to allow himself to be murdered conspired against and killed in brutal way crucified and then he proved through his death that he is the architect of life and that death and Lucifer and the powers of evil, the principalities, they have no bearing on his authority. And he showed with his resurrection that they have no power, authority, control uh, over him and his rising to glory and sitting at the, the right hand of the Father, and that he is the answer and the way and the light, uh, the truth, and it's only through him that we can be guaranteed an eternal inheritance, which includes immor immortality, a return to our first estate, um, uh, infinity, you know, ac acquiring salvation is the most beautiful, most awesome gift I mean, life is incredible, yes, but can you imagine eternal life? I, and, and so uh, I'm with you as to um, this is the most important thing. I dedicate my whole life to bringing this truth, this message to other people as, to, uh, as I know you and Daniel and, and many others, those of us that have come to this understanding that realize the importance, the message of John uh, chapter 1 and of the gospel, the fullness of both the Old and the New Testament, as well as all of the extra biblical and extra canonical texts, because they all verify this as truth. And so, you know, that's why I read the poem that I read at the very beginning. I wish more than anything that people have this discernment. Daniel? Um, well, time is ticking down. I know one of the things that Carolyn really wanted to talk about tonight was the transporter. So, Carolyn, why don't you talk about the transporter at this point? Please. Well, I don't, I don't even know if we have time. <laughs> well, we can certainly, um, you know, do another show whenever you guys are willing and y'all uh, have time. We can we'll do that. Um, maybe just kind of set the premise so that we can pick it up in another show. Uh, and if you would, um, mention somewhat uh, about Atlantis, because that was asked as well. Okay. Um, actually, I could. You know, it's really weird, because I kind of really did want to talk about the transporter a little bit. And I'm not sh I mean, I could at least start on it. Yes. I'm please. just thinking that I just wonder why I've had so much trouble trying to get online today. And it makes me think that part of it is that has to do with not only the secret space program, but also about this transporter. So I, I would like to go ahead and try to, to, to get that off. Um, Atlantis, I, 
I could try to maybe talk more about it another time. Yeah. I could go a little bit more into detail, but not much. Yeah. Just but, do uh, what you can, and then uh, we'll pick okay. it up in, an, in another show. I mean, even the beings I've met, I didn't even get a list of that. I'll have to put the list out uh, of the beings I've actually been in contact with and dealt with and worked with in Lucifer's hierarchy and all that. But okay, um, the off world, I call it the off world transporter. Uh, I wrote this about. This is information I wanted to read on air. It's what I wrote Daniel the year uh, last year, I think it was. I got deathly sick when I, right after I was just finishing writing the last sentence of this and telling him about it, and I had I have pictures that I'll I'll probably put it on my blog to to il- help illustrate. I've I've looked for pictures that some of the pictures I found online I found it has to do with the Orion program. Uh, what you see online have to do with the Orion program is like is a stone age compared to what this is involved in like off-world transport. So um, in this off-world transport, that is where a part of, part of me is like, I, I'm actually, it's me. It's like, I'm actually put into a body and into like a clone type of a body. It's the same one. There's a certain body. And one of the reasons that they use people like me to do that sort of a thing is because if there's an accident or they need to leave the body behind, like deep space. Someone like me who knows how to get back, um, because we're astral, know how to get back astrally. You know that's that's viable. You know it's like the body's expendable, and the person can come back. So that's why they've used people like me and trained them up as a little kid to use in these programs. Right. So uh, again, I'm not the only one here. You know there's lots of people doing this stuff, mm-hmm. and. I won't go into too much detail right now. I'd like I, w- I would like to sometime, but about the building where this is. But basically, let me see where I can start here. Um, there's a main control room. Um, that's this is after like I've gotten in the body. We suit up. Or we all have suits alike. Uh, we're like there's a team of us that were like uh, eleven of us. Uh, let's see, where is it? There's a cylinder. Okay, there's a large room. There's a cylinder that is. I don't know, probably about five or about four, four feet off the ground. It may even go deeper than, you know, deep into the, deeper than the floor. But there's a platform. We have to walk up a few steps around the platform. There's a, a rubber mat or on the platform. We stand around this cylinder. And ahead of us, in front of us, okay, our, our back is like, some of us have our backs to the wall. Um, it's like we're in a semicircle. Okay, so... Um, let me see where I start reading this. Okay, on the wall, okay, we take our positions around the cylinder. We face toward the cylinder. On the wall, we are looking toward a large window of medium dark tinted glass. That is the main control room. We see a few people in there. They are men, each dressed the same, wearing white short sleeve shirts, dark pants. The main person in charge is not seated at a control desk. He is watching us. He is wearing a small headset. He moves around the room checking this and that, and he speaks to us through a speaker. All systems check. When the system is engaged, um, I remember the usual, the usually deafening sound and a furious blast of white light that emerges from at least the entire circumference of the cylinder. As the blast of light emerges like a white burst, like white bursting flames and rays, we can see the control room through the tops of the flames and rays of intense light energy. We have eye contact with the men in the control room who are watching us intently as if to perceive our very thoughts of that moment as we are moments away from transport. I perceive the man, the man in charge is concerned that every second we are all fine. He also wonders what it is like to be there we, with us or be there like we are at that very second. It's like I can remember looking at the man's eyes, and I know that's what he's thinking. It's like you could see it in his eyes. Okay, I am I'm thinking as I always do at the moment before transport that the burst of light, which is much like an explosion that sucks us in uh, like a flash, is not easy. But like diving into a pool of cold water, which seems unpleasant at the start, the body adjusts itself and the initial shock is over. Knowing ahead of time what to expect makes it easier. The man in the control room still does not know if he could do it. It certainly is not for everyone. When the burst of light takes us, it is probably like a wind, being like in a wind tunnel, only it is all light moving around us. In a way, it's like moving through a hurricane. 
we, the crew, are all there together, and we can see each other through the vi th though visibility is blurry. We are a unit together. We are still in a semicircle, but closer together. The commander, who was on the other side of the cylinder, um, the terms collider and, and uh, colander come, came to, to mind. Those are just words that came to me. Um, it's now only a few feet in front of me. Okay. We are wearing white suits, much like what astronauts wear, but we, but not so cumbersome. Our colors are white and orange. We have orange trim on our suits. Um, I, I am me, but a body that doesn't look like I do here. My body, it's the body I do the projects in. I'm, I'm about five foot two or five four, medium to slim build. I have a short brown hair, which is straight, and a sort of page boy style haircut. I have brown eyes. I look to be in my late twenties. Though we are. Though we in the project have the same rank, we do have a senior officer, a man whom appears to be in his late 40s. He's about six foot two tall, slim build, uh, parts his hair on his left side, his sideburns are turning gray. He, uh, I think he has an American flag on the left breast of his suit. On our missions, we address him as commander. He is the one who runs us through our checklist when we get to the module away station. That term module away station is a term I am, I am not normally familiar with, but it's, that's, that is just what I know we call it. Um, we, have a, a, we have an away shuttle, more advanced than any pictures you will ever see on the internet. Uh, when, we have, when we have set up in deep space for communication, uh, we have a setup in deep space for communication, though often it doesn't work well, and there is significant delay in reception after after relay. Okay, now there's more I could I could tell about it like in another time, but there's like different stations set off. It's kind of like what like a jump. I guess I use like jump type of jump gate technology, but they actually can send humans from one station to the next station for deep space uh, exploration and. Uh, I don't know. There's just there's other things. I have uh, memories of being on a certain certain type of a planet to do exploration. If I really took time to think about it, I could. I'm sure I could bring up more memories about it. They're there. So I just wanted to get that out because I know I'm not the only one that remembers stuff like this. And right, I just want to uh, expose it. You know. <laughs> there's um there's other testimony. I think they call it uh, Project Pegasus. Um, even Andrew Basaggio talks about this. Um. Laura Magdalena Eisenhower, she also speaks about this. Uh, can you tell us uh, about some places where you've been as far as this jump room the, um, you know, the, that you recall? Uh, Mars, the, the moon, anything, any, uh, or any other places um, that you remember having been to using this technology? This technology took us way far out that it's places that people aren't even familiar with. Wow. And though I can tell you I know in my I know that I know why I was there and what we were doing, but I haven't taken time to eat to investigate. It's kind of like I don't it's it's a weird thing. Maybe maybe it's like the programming that they don't want me to. It's like I haven't there's more important things for me to know. And it's kind of like I don't want to know. It's like I want to know but I don't. So I mean, I could find out. I don't know that it's that important at this point. Um, well, let me ask you this. In in your travels or your having gone to any of these other places, do you recall seeing any megalithic structures or any kind of ancient civilizations, anything of that nature? Um, no, there was out-of-body when I was, this is a whole nother thing, bringing in the, what they told, what I was told were Arcturians to, it was a portal opened. There was a gray, grayish planet. There were, there were, of course there were entities that were living there. I don't remember any structures there, but I know that there were there, that they were there. Uh, I've been, we used to meet in like temples and other realms. Mm -hmm. Now, as for the moon, that sort of thing, I mean, I don't have the memories or it's probably not even the experience that some people have of seeing like what the type of structures you mentioned. No, I don't remember seeing any of that. 
and I actually I don't think I have. So um, I don't have that in my testimony. I know people who do. I don't think they're ready to talk about it yet, but it's a matter of time. They're out there. I believe it. Totally believe it. Uh, there's another question from the chat room. Um, does Carolyn know M.T. Keshe, K-E-S-H-E, um, from SpaceshipInstitute.org? Uh, I'm not familiar myself with that. But um, but after you answer this question, Carolyn, if you would, give out your blog site, your website information again, and then we'll go to Dan, and I'll, I'm going to give him the same opportunity. And also, you know, any email or Facebook or anything of that nature that you want okay. to share. Yeah, I'm I'm not familiar with that person, that Kesh. I don't listen to other people. It's I'm I don't know, I'm having a hard enough time trying to get my own information written down <laughs> and, and, and out. I'm it's just, you know, it's heavy. It's heavy stuff. So it's hard enough for me to deal with my own without reading somebody else's. So what I do is I have a few friends once in a while who I call them like my liver or where they, they digest stuff, give me the cliff notes to it. And so I could kind of know what's other people are saying but uh that per that particular person i'm not familiar with that was mentioned yeah neither this, am I. okay okay your um, website um blog yeah all i ha i just right now the only thing i have going um with my information is my blog which is beyond the physical realm Dot com. I may go back on to Facebook. I'm not sure yet. It's just time. Facebook can be time consuming. Right. And so that's another reason why I'm I'm staying off of Facebook. And because there are people impersonating me and trying to say stuff I wasn't saying. And it's just better this way. They're attacking the messenger. Yeah. Or, yes. or making it look like I'm... Well, they were making fake profiles right. from what people were telling me. So I just decided to make it harder for that to happen. So I'm just not on there. So. Uh, Dan, uh, can we get your contact and as well as your where people can go to support your work and listen to your shows? Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you for that again. Um, BrideMovement.com. That's bride as in a groom and a bride and movement.com. And I also want to say that uh, people can get more information about Carolyn on there at our Mind Control tab. All right. Well, hey, I want to appreciate, uh, thank both of you and let you know I appreciate you uh, for the opportunity and for coming on for our show. So reposted an article that I wrote a couple of years ago. It's called I Am Not Afraid. I Was Born for This. And that is pretty much, that's my statement. And that's how I live my life, and many people I know are the same way. I mean, in this world, it's like there are no civilians. It's, there's like, there's a war that's actually going on, a spiritual war. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I think um, that a lot of people will be inspired and are inspired by your stance with truth and with Christ and with the... Make it, making a priority of the kingdom because a lot of people find themselves on the fence and they can't decide one way or the other especially for those that are just initially awakening to uh, for instance the new world order and the global elite and um, the push for police state government and uh, all of the things that are connected with that the FEMA concentration camps all that and so a lot of people are afraid, and they um, really, you know, once they are open, open themselves to the possibility of accepting this as truth, um, they are scared, and they don't know really which way to turn, because when they, because I know when I first woke up, I wanted to talk about these kind of things with you know, all my loved ones, my friends, all my family members, anybody that um, would listen, this is the, the things that I wanted to talk about. But then I, I found really that nobody wanted to talk about these things. And not a lot of people, especially back in 2004, could relate to uh, the things that I was learning. And, um, and that held uh, priority for me as being important because... 
Um, another thing that happens when when we find ourselves awakening is that it's hard for us to just you know go back to the the old sense of being to where we could be nonchalant about a lot of topics. Um, I, I became very serious in nature and in my study, and I didn't want to waste any time and and it was out only after a while, you know, after several years of uh, basically um, running my family and my friends uh, away from me that I learned to not be all serious all the time and to find, to, to learn to find joy and entertainment and humor in life again and not to be always just focused on these very heavy issues because I, I found it to be burdensome to to soul to always be focused on just the the heaviness of you know the studies that we do with uh, conspiracies and new world order and that kind of thing and so um and so yours uh, dan's myself all those that are doing this kind of work to try to help people to understand what we're dealing with as far as uh, the matrix uh, of world and the situation the the spiritual warfare against these powers and principalities and those that have um taken allegiance with them um it it's encouraging and it helps people to find forums to where they can talk about these things and find others that they can you know re- most are afraid of unknown depths Skirting shores thinking world flat I'm with the island girls In celebration of new religion Nobody led me or said this way I sailed alone on makeshift raft With wind as companion Fate for deliverance Confidence enough to assess New disposition Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Pick it up next week. I would like everybody to know I wish discernment for them more than all else. Not ready yet to each in their own time. Long has it been in coming to this, wallowing through the uncertainty of false righteousness, trailing fragment truth. The spirit found me, courting awkward circumstance, recognition with others of kindred soul. Awakening, I went seeking others. We are to remind each other, one another, of past legend even as we question our own soul's knowing. And we laugh passing time, sharing passages of favored scripture immortalized to paper. He will come again, announcing presence with signs and wonder. Night recedes, sunrise on the lips of morning. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here at freedomslips.com on Studio B. And I thank those of you that have joined us live and are uh, have access to the chat for taking the time to fellowship and for always lending us your very kind support. Uh, we consider you to be very well-educated and uh, a blessing to share dialogue with. I have as guests with me this evening for the next two hours, both Dan Duval and Carolyn Hamlet, um, and I'm considered a great honor to be able to to share this interview with them and share this time and space to talk about the incredible information that uh, both Carolyn and Dan have to offer uh, humanity and world. And so I thank both of you for taking the time to join me this evening and for giving me the opportunity to bring forth this show in the capacity that we are. 
Uh, Dan, let me give you a chance to say hello, and then we'll go to Carolyn. Well, thank you so much, Zen. It's a pleasure to be back on your program. I really appreciate the invite for both me and Carolyn. Uh, we had a great time last time, and we're able to share some really, really, uh, I think, uh, incredible things. And um, I just appreciate your ability as a host to bring out all of that. So I have a personal ministry website at bridemovement.com, and people can go and check that out. I have several books on there as well as links to our podcast and also a blog. And um, that's about it for me, Carolyn. Hey, um, thanks for having me back on Zen. It's uh, really enjoyed doing the last program. Um, you're a wonderful, wonderful host to to work with. Feel very much at ease with you. And uh, anyway, thank you, thank you again for the gracious welcome. Well, and, uh, I, I appreciate both of you as well, and and thank you. Um, let me, and I know Dan that you have a radio program, and Carolyn, you have a website, so. Before we go any further, Dan, if you'll talk about where people can go to support your work and um, any contact information, Facebook or anything of that nature that you might want to share. And uh, Carolyn, then you know we can talk about your, your website and your blog as well. Well, uh, my podcast is called Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. I guess the easiest way to find that is just to Google Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall or just... Dan Duvall, it comes right up on the Google rankings, and um, it posts on various things. I go on Blog Talk and Podomatic and Spreaker and everything posts over to YouTube. The central point to find all of that that we're putting out is bridemovement.com, which has links to our archives for the radio program as well as a uh, link to our YouTube channel. Um, and also different pages that describe everything we're endeavoring to do. One of the things we are putting together is uh, a, a vision for DID coaching. This is uh, a, an attempt to help people that have dissociative identity disorder as a result of satanic ritual abuse and government-sponsored mind control projects that cannot afford to finance their own help. And uh, we're starting off with a, a team of coaches that we're putting together to work with individuals, um, all of the costs being underwritten by the ministry itself, and then um, phase two and three include the building of uh, places, uh, facilities, in order to help people whose living situation is so compromised they can't be helped under current circumstances. And so uh, we are uh, <laughs> um, accepting donations, and if people want to support some of the work that we're doing, they can also just go to bridemovement.com. Well, that's a fantastic endeavor. Um, I applaud you in your efforts to, you know, service and to provide support in in that manner. That is, um, I know a lot of people will be very greatly appreciative. Uh, Carolyn? Well, I have just a blog site, and it is beyondthephysicalrealm.com. I've had that probably, I think, since... I think 2006. So um, I periodically add articles to that, some of my thoughts. I have plans to add much more and also to do my own like videos for YouTube channel. That'll be next, hopefully. Uh, can you mention like um, some of the latest blog uh, posts that you've done or that you've been working on? Well, the most recent one was actually to announce this show that we're doing right now. <laughs> well, so, uh, there's just there was just a, an increase of interest on this topic, and so I went ahead and made that made a separate post to let people know. You know, if they a lot of people go onto my blog daily, and so I wanted them to make sure that they they saw that because I think what we're going to be covering tonight is really important information and I think a lot of people are going to be able to relate to it so um, that's why I did that I also because um, I know that I you know, turned a lot of my friends and my family members um, had them turn the other way and run as fast as they can just because they didn't want to listen to the things that I wanted to talk about and they weren't ready um, and there was a time where 
some of them came full circle and um and you know came to ask me about those things that I had mentioned before but I find it's a lot easier to just now to plant seeds and allow people to be where they are and when they reach a point where they're ready for the information that you want to share with them that they'll be more eager as well to to open themselves and to grasp um, what you're speaking on. Dan? Well, um, I've run into the same things. Uh, you know, I've been kicked out of churches and been called a heretic, which, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, name it. Um, what, what I found is similar to what you're saying. People that need it the most sometimes are the, the, the most resistant to it. Uh, when you're talking about getting people caught up to speed with what is actually happening, I tell people to take it back to Ephesians chapter 4. It, there's, there's a reference to speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4 verse 15. And I tell people that means speaking the right truth at the right time with the right motive. Right. And that keeps your hands clean and your motives pure when you are engaging people uh, and trying to wake them up. Um, I know like my paradigm has gone through many, many shifts then. And I have gone from, like, uh, conspiracy Nazi, like, oh, my gosh, I have to know everything, and this is all depressing, and I, you know, doing a tailspin, crash my plane, like, ah, I just want to die, and, you know, all that. And uh, progressed through that into a lot of revelation, really, about who God is and what his plan is. And we'll be talking about that somewhat tonight, the plan of God. Um, But for me, it's been the relationship with God. And getting his perspective on things that have revolutionized not only my life but my ministry as a whole. Um, I, I work with a number of people, as you can imagine, you know, government-sponsored mind control, uh, satanic ritual abuse, you name it. I hear the worst of the worst every day, mm-hmm. then every single day. I'm talking um, – Murder, rape, torture, abuse, neglect, brutality. Um, <laughs> every day, that's what I hear. And you know what? In spite of that, many of my sessions where I'm working with people are filled with laughter. <laughs> and, yes. and it's because of this. The Bible says, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. And what I found is that in the presence of God, there is joy that transcends circumstance and situation, knowledge base and fact. And when we abide in that presence, then it changes everything. There's a reason why Psalm 2 says the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. He's not intimidated by his enemies at all. Right. And when we graduate into his perspective, <laughs> we begin to shame the devil with our attitude, mm-hmm. actions, and breakthroughs. And relationship with God that changes everything about us and the world around us. You know, so I I, I have a perspective that it carries me through the work God has called me to do. And, um, you know, I, I, I just rejoice that, you know, he's taught me how to not sink my ship on these things. Relate to that um, also ha- have done some, at least some of the research uh, to make themselves informed on on these topics and and it's still you know even today uh, we're really still a minority um, that most people have still little regard and not much concern for uh, those things which are important to us as far as uh, learning truth Um, comment Carolyn and then we'll get Dan to comment I totally relate to (laughs) to what you said and uh, I'm still trying to find the balance it's uh trying well much of my life i didn't have much humor i've actually been learning how to to enjoy life more i mean there was a time where i enjoyed life but it it was like about when i just before the 2000 election i call it selection presidential selection (laughs) in the united states and you know toward the end of Clinton's reign. Well, even I can back up further. You know, some of that information's on my blog. When I started seeing what I knew was going to happen from being in the organization and knowing what their plan was, since I was out of it, um, of course, I wasn't happy 
and looking forward <laughs> to what was ahead. So, I mean, I had a hard time having fun because I couldn't forget the reality that I lived that moment, what I knew was real and what was happening, that a lot of people didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. I knew. And especially when uh, 9-11 happened, right. a lot of people woke up then too. But it was like, to me, I just I just knew that that was it. You know, I just, I had to try to get more of a, my information out. I was trying before that time and it was difficult and it even got even more difficult after 2001. But the thing is that uh, now, you know, in spite of how reality oriented I am, I still have to, to look for the, the things to laugh at, the smell the roses along the way. There's still right. a lot of good, a lot of good in this world. So um, I just try to, try to enjoy that and I encourage everybody else to also I mean the, we can when we get when people wake up they generally are very zealous and enthusiastic right and they have the energy they can burn out you know so exactly. and they can burn everybody else out around them if they're not careful so um, I just encourage everybody don't give up on people just you know pray for them to help help wake them up and some of these people will not wake up until things get really bad and then they might have to look up and see what's happening right yeah here's another thing and then, and then we'll go to dan um that i wish i would have known or that somebody would have um kind of schooled me on when i first came to realization about some of these things like 9-11 and the government-sponsored terror and the conspiratorial sign uh, as far as the what we're dealing with as world is that um to honor people where they are and if they're not ready for the information to not just try to drill them um you know to 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 not just you know overwhelm them with stuff that they're gonna just uh think is absolutely crazy anyways 